Lean Entrepreneurship. And so let's give a welcome and thank you for most. Thank you very much. I was going to say keep on talking. You are doing a very nice job. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It officially, it's 12.01, so good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming. The topic is very relevant. Uh, I was going to say interesting, but that would be self-serving. It's very relevant because it doesn't really matter if you are working for yourself or working for an employee, then the material will be useful to you. How many of you are self-employed over here before I get started? Well, about 60% of the, of the audience. Welcome. Uh, may I suggest that uh, all of you are self-employed? May I suggest that you never work for anybody else? And the biggest mistake that you can ever make is to think that you are working for anybody else but yourself and your family. It may be true that ASL is giving you a check every Friday afternoon, but you always work for yourself. And if you have that mindset, that entrepreneurship mindset, then your performance is going to be different. Your effectiveness will be different. Your efficiency will be different. So everybody is self-employed. Say yes. yes. OK, this is a good crowd. The first technical difficulty. Now, Kaizen is the Japanese word which means continuous improvement. In English, they say continuous improvement, right? And Kai means change. Zen means good. Change for the better. Change is good. Don't be afraid of change or continuous improvement, as they say. Lean refers to the system or entity that is waste-free, like lean meat, perhaps. If you say it doesn't have excess fat, a lean system doesn't have excess fat, doesn't have excess waste. So basically, when we say Kaizen system or Kaizen methodology or lean system, we are referring to something that you regularly improve and you take the waste out. I, as an engineer, have used the word optimize a lot. How many people use optimize? Yeah, OK. May I suggest this is not a good word? May I suggest this is the last day you use optimize? Optimize basically denotes that you cannot improve it any further. I went to this chip manufacturing company in Folsom, California. And I was talking to about 120 engineers and managers. And we were talking about Kaizen and optimize. One of the engineers said, well, uh, how much knowledge do you have about our industry? And th this is one of those loaded questions, right? Because normally, when I, any place I go, they say, well, Kaizen is for Toyota. Toyota is manufacturing, is automotive. I'm not automotive. I'm not manufacturing. So based on that, Kaizen does not apply. But it's a system. And the system can apply to bakery as much as it can apply to Boeing aircraft or Disney or hospital. It's a system, right? So based on that, I was posed this question, uh, was asked this question, how much do you know about our industry, chip manufacturing? I said, zilch. And he said, OK, well, then you, you don't understand. In our industry, when we say optimize, we really mean it. For example, this particular chip is optimized until the next chip comes around. I said, OK. Now, I said, well, uh, let me just demonstrate my point. If you are saying that if your boss would come to your office with a suitcase full of $100,000 cash, and he puts it on your desk and says, John, make this chip that is optimized a little bit faster, a little bit cheaper, a little bit lighter, or have it run a little bit cooler. You will tell your boss, take your money away and leave my office. I cannot do it because this is optimized. At which point, 119 other people say, we'll take the money. All right? So I, I said, well, I rest my case. We can always improve things. And that is what Kaizen is. So Kaizen is continuous improvement incrementally. The major difference between the East and the West is that we are only dazzled in the West with magnificent breakthroughs. We don't appreciate small improvement. When I went to Japan for the second time or first time, perhaps, uh, a long time ago, I was given a presentation by a group of workers at Toyota, and their 
claim to fame was they had made improvement for 2.4 centimeters. That's less than an inch, right? And everybody was, oh my God, in awe. And the plant manager was over there, we were asking a lot of questions. They acknowledged these people. And I was telling myself, they brought me all the way from the US to Japan for 2.4 centimeters. What is 2.4 centimeters? But once I understood 2.4 centimeters is the foundation for breakthroughs, is a foundation for iPhones, is foundation for Microsoft, then I realized the value of it. Any questions so far? And by the way, if you have any questions, you can stop me. Uh, we, we will have 10, 15 minutes, end of the presentation, but uh, I guess you can stop me as well. So this is a good graphic form to show what Kaizen is. This guy over here is really working hard. However, this one is a Kaizen version of this. A little bit leaner as well, as you <laughs> see, and he's pushing the cart, right? I'm sorry? <coughs> oh, the cartoon, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, the, if you exercise, you should be a little bit leaner. So here's the definition. Can, can you, can somebody read this thing out loud for me, please? Entrepreneurship is living a few years of your life like most people won't, so that you can spend the rest of your life like most people can't. That, that, that is what entrepreneurship is. I, I like this definition. I went to Brazil in November, and I lectured on entrepreneurship six different campuses on, on behalf of the university that I teach at. And I realized that all the campuses that I went to visit were very close to the beaches. Of course, Brazil is, Brazil means beach, right? So it was very close to the beaches. So I started all my lectures with this question. I said, would you like to enjoy the beach for 20 minutes or would you like to one day own the beach? It's a very good question because I made it up. It's a very good question, <laughs> right? It's a very good question. Why? Because if you have the mindset to enjoy the beach for 20 minutes, you are a salary person. And if you have the mindset of owning the beach one day, then you are an entrepreneur. Now, as I mentioned to you, entrepreneur doesn't mean that you have to be working for your own company, but you're always the president of your personal services corporation. So maybe you want to write it down. This is a good note to take home. For the price of the seminar, this is a good note. You are always the president of your personal services corporation. Doesn't matter what your company is and who writes your check or who gives you the paycheck. In 2003, entrepreneurship produced almost twice as many jobs in the US. Close to 2 million jobs compared to 1 million jobs for big firms. So Mark alluded to the fact that big firms are getting all the benefits as far as the training and research and development and everything else. And they are giving the least amount of benefit to the community based on this, at least in 2003. I don't have the record. I don't have the statistics for other years. But 2003, 2 million jobs were created by small firms. With women and minorities coming to the workforce, they actually bring different flavor to the work. So now we got a lot more creativity as a result of that. They come up with uh, better ideas and different ideas. They set the direction differently. And as a result, they bring different energy and passion to the marketplace. Ideas, if you are 10% better than what we have, then that will be sufficient for the marketplace. Actually, more than 10% marketplace may not be able to digest it. So take the product or service that is available to us right now, improve it by 10%, that will be sufficient for you to be successful. But you have to have the right direction. And right direction means that you have to have the structure, and we will talk about the system. You will have to have the structure. You will have to have the competence level. You have to become a perpetual learning organism. So it means that regularly you are learning. You always remain as a student, not the follower, student, right? And then, of course, you will have to have the structure in your organization to be able to sustain the success, and then you have to have passion. How many people believe that uh, you should do what you have passion in or what you are passionate about? Okay, please don't agree with that anymore. <laughs> 
If I want to do only what I'm passionate about, I will eat chocolate the whole day. <laughs> Isn't true? So these are the myths that we have in our society, and we accept them, and we do them. You should become passionate in what you have to do. Sometimes I have to clean the garage. I'm not passionate about that, but I have to. If I, have, if I learn the art to become passionate about the things that I will have to do, then I'll become a lot more successful. Right? Not everything is rosy all the time, but you have to become passionate about it, and passion is just a fuel. Now, my late mentor, Mr. Jim Rohn, used to say that if you have an idiot and you motivate them, now you have a motivated idiot. <laughs> so motivation, even though it's necessary, but it's not, the, it's not everything. In America, we say, oh, you just have to be motivated and you have to be passionate and blah, blah, blah. And they give seminars on that. I cannot believe that. I cannot believe that motivation could be the title of a seminar, right? But it is. This is just a fuel and passion and motivation without direction, without competence, and without ideas. The good ideas can actually kill. Is everybody with me? Say yes. yes. Okay. I help you with the difficult questions. So there are three premises. Premise number one, before anything else like quality, efficiency, design, market share, cost, customer service, or anything else become even mentionable, there is this one word that you have all get used to or be gauged against. What is that one word? Everything that we do, it has to become, it has to be this first before we talk about market share or customer satisfaction or other things. Come on, we don't have that much time. Effectiveness. How did you? My goodness. Yeah. <laughs> effectiveness, right? So effectiveness is the a, is a key. Now, there is another word which is similar to effectiveness, and we regularly use it, and that is called efficiency. But really, efficiency is always secondary. Effectiveness is always first, right? So effectiveness basically says what? Effectiveness says that we have to do the right job, right decision right action. Efficiency says that we have to do the job right. And efficiency basically says that you have to use the least amount of resources. Effectiveness says that going to China and open up another branch in China, is it the right idea? If it is, then you are doing the right thing. Now, doing it with the least amount of resources means efficiency. So a lot of people talk about efficiency without really considering effectiveness. If your task is to go to Sacramento, the most efficient way, and you call me after 20 minutes and you say, Hormoz, I got to Sacramento. I say, my goodness, 20 minutes, that's very efficient. Only to find out you ended in Saratoga. So you were very efficient doing the wrong thing. Effectiveness is always the, right, uh, the first thing that you have to consider. Kaizen is all about effectiveness first. And then, of course, you cannot rent a helicopter to go to Sacramento, make it very expensive. It has to be efficient as well. However, first you have to be effective, and then you have to become efficient. Effectiveness is simply assumed. You cannot negotiate effectiveness. For example, in accounting firms, you cannot be proud that your records are 80% accurate. They have to always be 100% accurate. So effectiveness is a given. You cannot go and purchase any kind of product and expect it not to work. If you buy something from dollar store and it doesn't work and you go back to dollar store, you don't expect to hear, what do you expect? You only pay 99 cents for this. It's not supposed to work. You don't expect that it's supposed to work. So effectiveness is always first. But efficiency, has different levels. For example, FedEx has different delivery times. Depending upon how much you want to pay, they charge you. Next day, in two days, ground, economy, whatever the case might be. So that is the efficiency of the system. I went to this insurance company actually in, uh, in San Jose. The CEO is a lady. And she asked me, what is it that you want to teach us? Uh, another loaded question. I, I don't know why I get all these loaded questions, right? 
I said, well, ma'am, there is nothing I can teach you, uh, or I like to teach you, but I just like to make an observation and you tell me why it is. And she said, okay, go ahead. I said, why is it that we have five weeks worth of wait time for a life insurance application? How much work is there? And she said, well, number one is not five weeks, it's only four weeks. I said, well, fine. <laughs> right? And number two, she said, well, actually, there's a lot of work. But after we got to it and we standardized it, it was about nine hours worth of work. Nine hours worth of work, and it takes four weeks. Now, I, I still say five weeks because they really take five weeks, but she said four weeks, so we take her word for it. Four weeks. Nine hours worth of work, four weeks. Now, here's the question. Are we waiting for China to come over here and show us how they can do it in five hours? Then we say, oh, by the way, I can do it in three hours, which is too late. You've got to become efficient and effective before competition does it to you. And that's exactly what happened to the auto industry. When Deming, uh, does anybody know Deming? Oh, okay, good. When Deming came up with all these beautiful programs for quality, and he, worked, he went to the big three in Michigan, we practically told Deming that, hey, our quality is good, we don't need you, thank you very much, don't waste our time. And he had to go to Japan to present a paper, and Japanese kept him over there. For several years, in fact. And they build this Kaizen program and the quality program using Deming's idea as well as other <coughs> Japanese uh, engineers and scientists that they had at the time. So it's very important for us to become effective and efficient at the same time. One of the things that, uh, and before, before competition, before it's actually necessary, one of the things that I saw when I went to Japan, 7 o'clock in the morning, we went to the factory with the department manager. And because of the language barrier and everything else, I had to guess some of the things that they were happening. And we had an interpreter as well. And I realized that the department manager said something to the team leader. And there was a team of uh, five people working over there in the cell. They call it the, call it the manufacturing cell. And the team leader went and pulled one of those guys out. And for the next seven hours, the four people struggled to do the work of five people. And finally, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon toward the end of the shift, bingo. Four people are doing the work of five people. I asked the department manager, why did you have to do it? Was it a mandate from upstairs? He said, no, if I don't do it, then my comp competition will do it. So I better do it before they do. So, you, you don't sit down and improve yourself because you are in bad shape. You improve yourself because everything is good and you want to become better, right? H has anybody read the book, Good to Great? Jim Collins is, is a red book and is, is very simple read and is about 20 years old, but it's very, very good book for, for businesses. So because, because you don't want to stay good and good is actually the enemy of great. Just because you are good, you become complacent and you don't do anything about it. Just because you don't want to stay good, you always want to get better, that's what you have to do before your competition does. Any question about this slide? Reflection, questions? Okay. Premise number two. So premise number one was that effectiveness is assumed and is not negotiable and you have to become effective. Premise number two is entropy principle. Entropy principle is thermodynamics, but simple. Simple definition is that everything, if left alone, is going to tend to go towards disorder. Everything in the nature. If you have a bunch of ball bearings in your hands and you let them go in a sloped surface, they don't follow one another, even though they all were released from the same hands. Every one of them tend to go different direction. Why? I don't know. I was not consulted with some of these things when you know, Earth was created. But this is the way it is. So we just have to accept it as one of the laws of the nature and make sure that we make it work for us. So basically, what, what it says over here, that everything by longevity requires refinement. So the fact that I said the proce processes up in 1970s doesn't mean that they will have to work the same smoothness throughout the years. Everything by longevity requires refinement, requires Kaizenization regularly, right? 
And once disorder is attained, it will never go back to order, to a state of order by itself. So if you hear that your car is making funny noise, and next day you hear the noise is gone, the noise is not gone. <laughs> right? The noise is there. Why? Because it's a law. Again, you cannot argue with these laws. That's a law. That's entropy principle. Now, this is a graphic way. If we got everything orderly like this, after time passes, everything is going to look like this. So it will not be orderly anymore. Another example is that if you have a truck full of bricks and you toss bricks outside the truck, they will never, ever end up like this. It will always be like this. That's a law again. Your business, if you don't attend it regularly, and we will talk about four controls in your business. One of them is financial control, but there are other three controls. If you don't attend your business regularly, it will become like this. And then you cannot look surprised. I don't know why it went like this. Because everybody's going to tell you because of the law of entropy. That's what it is. Law of entropy works even if you don't know about it. Any question about law of entropy? Say no. Okay. The third premise. If you wish to achieve success, success should always be at the service of others, not at their expense. Right? If you wish to become successful, you should become successful at the service of others. When you become a service-oriented person, the money will come. A lot of people, well, what is the main reason we go to into business? What is the main reason we go into business? Oh, we want to start our business. Make money. Make money. Helping people. Make money, right? Okay, so the people who say making money, please don't say that make money anymore. <laughs> because money is necessary for business. The same as oxygen being necessary for your life, for living, right? However, Oxygen is not the reason for living. If somebody says, why are you alive? And you say, to consume oxygen. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's shallow. Right? Money is necessary. But you are not in business for the money. You are in business to expand your dazzled clientele, give service as much as possible, and the money will come. Money is a byproduct of giving service. So that's a premise number three for entrepreneurship. Okay, now we get into the maybe details are a little bit technical. The traditional approach says that cost plus profit is equal to price. Right? Everybody follow? And price is set by the marketplace. Price is not something that the business owner can set. Especially in a free enterprise. We live in a capitalistic society. In a capitalistic society, the marketplace sets the price, right? So the cost plus profit is equal to price is the traditional approach. So what is the lean approach? <coughs> lean approach says, well, I agree with the equation. I agree with the components of this equation. However, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to switch them around. Because traditional approach says the cost is going up regularly. The labor is going to go, go up. The material is going up. The uh, space is going up. Everything that we use in our business, constantly the cost is going up. I want to have additional profit as well. I'm not happy with yesterday's profit. So as a result, I would have to increase the price. And when you increase the price, you are saying that I'm doing it at the expense of others because customers will have to pay because I want more profit. The lean approach simply says that it is true that these are the components. However, I bring profit. I keep the profit over here, and I bring cost to the other side of the equation. So profit is equal to price minus cost. Same equation. Everybody follow? Same equation. I just move them around, right? And then, if I want to make more profit, I will have to reduce the cost. Because, why? Because this guy, the price, is not in my control. Now, for years, 
businesses that they were the only game in town, they did it to us. The Razor Prize, I mean, now we got, I mean, I cannot mention name of the businesses, but we got businesses that provide some essentials for our lives. And as a result, they regularly raise the price and we don't have anything. Remember the, the telephone companies in 1980s that government had to step in and deregulate the telephone company? It had got to that monopoly stage that they were the only game in town and they would call the shots. But in a free enterprise, you regularly have to reduce the cost in order to make more profit. This guy cannot be touched. This guy is like a deadline, cannot change. When, when your boss gives you a deadline for the project, the deadline doesn't change. Now, you can decide to sleep a little bit less, but deadline doesn't move. Price doesn't move. Price is something that the market decides what it is. But as an entrepreneur, we need to be scientific. So we are dealing with data and information and knowledge. What is the definition of data? What is data? Data is some kind of metrics, perhaps, measurement. What else? Good thing I showed up today, huh? <laughs> data is, as gentleman mentioned, is, is measurement, is metrics. What is a raw number? Data is meaningless. I'm sorry? If you extract the meaning out of it. Data by itself is meaningless. If you don't know what it means, I go to doctor, doctor says your cholesterol is 480. If I don't know what it means, I say, thank you very much, doctor, I'm about to leave. And doctor says, no, no, no. He extracts the meaning out of it. It becomes information. And it says 480, it means that you are about to die, right? And now, after I know what it means, then is a knowledge what to do with that information. So data is meaningless. Information, you extract meaning out of it. And knowledge is showing you what to do with that information. Now that you know what it means, there are cer certain things that you will have to do in order to improve your situation. So when we say we analyze the data, we're really saying we analyze the information, correct? Because uh, the data by itself, what, what difference does it make? If I don't understand what cholesterol level is supposed to be, Doctor may tell me if my cholesterol is 15, I still will be happy, or 480 will, me, will make me happy as well. But you have to understand what exactly it means. In your business as an entrepreneur, you have to know, because we are overloaded with data and information, you have to know exactly which data you are looking at. And you cannot be looking at 75,000 pieces of information, because it will be not be manageable. And there are certain number of things that we call them CSFs. And CSF stands for critical success factors. And normally, there are five or six or seven. For any kind of business, from jet engine to Persian rugs, there are only five or six or seven CSFs that if you master, you know enough about that business. And failure to master those CSFs almost guarantees your failure. Is everybody clear? Say yes. So, do you agree that knowledge is power? Okay, please don't agree. Please don't agree with everything I said today. Okay, no, knowledge is not power. Knowledge by itself is not power. If knowledge were power, then all the librarians would then be the most powerful people in the world, right? We know they are not. Okay, knowledge is not power. Then I change, I say, well, what is power then? Applied knowledge, right? Applied knowledge is power if you apply it. And that is called, in uh, management, it's called skill. If you have the knowledge and if you apply it, then we say you are skillful. Applied knowledge is power. Does everybody agree applied knowledge is power? OK, no, please don't agree. No. <laughs> if you apply the knowledge incorrectly, it will not be power. If I practice, if I practice my serve incorrectly, and I do it 150 times a day, after a few years, I will be superb at the wrong serve because I practice it the wrong way. So applied knowledge is not power. Only successfully applied knowledge is power. 
So a lot of entrepreneurs start a business and a lot more go out of business. They cannot claim that they are powerful now. But if only they do it correctly, and earlier we were talking, success is very easy, especially in America, it's very easy. Why? Because it has a formula. You just have to f follow formula. If you follow the formula, success is easy. 880 North is going to take you to Oakland. For how long? For past 250 years, it has done this. What if you are not knowledgeable about Oakland? You will still end up in Oakland. Whatever you don't want to go to Oakland. What if you don't want to go to Oakland? You still end up in Oakland if you follow the formula. And if you follow the formula and you successfully apply it, you become successful. There is no other choice. Is, that's a formula. So there is a KSAO formula for it. K stands for knowledge. S is skill how you apply it, or if you apply it. If you apply knowledge, it becomes skill. So we say so-and-so is skillful. But if you can pull it off successfully, then you have the ability. So A stands for ability. If the person is able, it means that had the knowledge, applied it successfully, and now has the ability. O stands for other necessary attribute. Now my mentor, Mr. Rohn, told me that you need to have two core competencies in addition to regular schooling. Two core competencies. One of them is communication leadership and the other one is selling. And I said, I don't like to sell. And he said, Mr. McGarry, you will not be successful then. I said, no, I really want to be successful. Then he said, then you really want to learn selling. I said, but I, I don't like it, and you won't be successful. There's no way around it. There's no way around it. In addition to a regular schooling, you can be an engineer, you can be a nurse, you can be in accounting. In addition to that, you have to have good communication and leadership skills and good selling skills. And selling doesn't mean that you go door to door and sell vacuum cleaners. It means that you can sell your ideas, you can convince, you can persuade, and you can change somebody else's mind about your approach and your concept, okay? So KSAO is one of the best formulas <laughs> developed so far. And this is how it works. Knowledge, which is your formal schooling, then you implement it, then you are becoming able, and then of course you have to add the other two components at least, maybe there are other components, uh, other uh, core competencies, but then if you have these things, the collection of all this information and knowledge becomes your formula for success. Now look at this for a few seconds. <coughs> right? This is big three when Dr. Deming approached them. Well, these are, they're going to make your job easier, no thanks and we are too busy and we don't have time, right? Now, sometimes we think that it is the economy that doesn't really allow us to flourish. I just want to prove it otherwise because all of you have the necessary talents and necessary skills and necessary abilities. You just have to put it to work. So one of the papers that you have on your, you had on your uh, sheet, on your chair, is the sheet of paper that has the blue sky thinking on it. Does everybody know blue sky? Thinking blue sky thinking is a methodology that uh, if sky is a limit and you don't have really any restrictions or any limitation, what would you do? And this is a very short exercise that we will do together. Mark was kind enough to cover the rest of it that we will not have time to do it today. However, for the people, just imagine that you are starting an accounting firm just to make sure that our host is getting some benefit out of this <laughs> seminar. Now, we got 50 consultants over here, intelligent audience. Take about three minutes and write down four different improvements in those four different columns in front of the people and say, how would you improve your people if you were the owner of this accounting firm? As far as the education, as far as their experience, the ability, the skills, the knowledge, how would you do it? 
three minutes, and then we'll get back to you. Is everybody clear about the exercise? Say yes. OK, it, it, it's easy. Sky's the limit. You can, you can send everybody to Oxford if you have to. So there is no limitation. There is no restriction. How can you improve your human capital? It's, it's not human resource, human capital. I don't like the phrase human resource. People are not resource. Resource is something that you use up, you abuse, and sometimes you misuse. People are not resource. Pe people are capital and expected to appreciate. And be as specific as possible. So don't, don't say make them more efficient. If, if you know how to make them efficient, mention it. You don't need to put your name on it if you don't want to. And this is all going to go to ASL. So I, will, I won't pick them up. I will not post it on the Newsweek cover magazine. And you, don't have to put your name you, don't, you don't have to put your name if you don't want to. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. They have, they have a suggestion program, so you can get credit for the good suggestions. OK, one minute. As far as work ethics, as far as culture, background, education, hands-on experience. <laughs> Sometimes lack of experience helps a lot. Younger generation who don't have any experience about anything, they are not afraid to fail, so they will try new things. I think about it 15 times before I do anything. So whatever you want to put over there. I also work a nonprofit organization with uh, kids in Fremont. And uh, I was teaching them goal setting in youth leadership class, goal setting. And one day, uh, maybe 11, 12 year old girl raised her hand as soon as I had this slide goal setting on the screen. And she said, uh, Mr. McGarry, may I tell you about my goals? And number one, I had never seen an 11, 12 year old so eloquent speaking, right? I said, sure, please. And she stood up and she said that in 2027, I will be a pediatrician. I will have an office in Santa Monica on the third floor looking over the ocean. And I think I will have another office in Santa Ana because I always want to go to Disneyland. I said, wow. I said, well, next time you teach and I sit down and take notes, right? So if you don't have experience, you can become a dentist in 2027. But if you have a lot of experience, you know it's going to be expensive. America is saturated of, of dentists. Nobody needs any dentistry anymore, blah, 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 blah. So sometimes maybe you, you write down over there, you hire people with no experience in accounting, whatever the case might be. Now, if you are finished, please pass it on to the f uh, head of the rows, and then I will, we will have him collected. Thanks. We can put them all over here. Thank you. Sorry. OK, here. So there are pre two major core competencies that we will have to master. Communication and leadership and sell, selling. But there is another thing in Japanese culture. And Japanese culture says if something is so-so but quick, is always better than perfect but slow. So when you want to implement a project and your people are hot about doing this project, 
And do it with cardboard. Do it with uh, duct tape. It doesn't have to look beautiful as long as it works and as long as it shows the concept, it doesn't have to. Because if you wait until you beautify it, bless you, if you wait until you beautify it, the chances are that people will lose that interest or passion that they have about it. So so-so but quick is better than perfect but slow. The reason you do KSAO is because the problem solving, scientific problem solving and gap analysis. And number one reason that why anybody is on any payroll is the problem solving skill. Now you may think that successful businesses are in different business, but they are all in problem solving. I want to go to San Diego and I have to be there in three hours. My car will not take me there in three hours. Southwest is going to solve that problem. They charge me, but they solve that problem. So they are not in airline industry. They are in problem solving industry. I go to doctor because my heart doesn't work correctly and he charges me $6,000 and he will fix it. He's not in medical field. He's in problem solving field. You, every individual over here in this room, to the degree, to the extent that you are a good problem solver, you will be very successful. If you are average problem solver, from time to time you find yourself on unemployment line. And if you are a poor problem solver, may God help you. Problem solving is the most important skill that anybody has. ASL doesn't do accounting. They are problem solvers. I got a problem, they solve it for me. Banking the same way, Boeing aircraft the same way, and etc. 10% improvement is sufficient, Kaizen principle. Regularly, but incrementally, you improve. 80-20 rule, and it's called Pareto principle. Anybody familiar with 80-20 rule? 80-20 rule simply says that 80% of your sales come from 20% of your people. Right? 80% of your friends give you 20% of the trouble. 20% of your friends give you all the problems, right? That's what 80-20 is, conversely. 80% of your work adds 20% of value. But it is those 20% that really add all the value. And if you can find out what those 20% of activities are in your business, then you can add all the value. And based on that, you need to have the critical success factors, and we will talk about it, key performance indicators, and always have an exit plan or plan B. What if it doesn't work out? What if it doesn't work out? You should always have a plan B. So you don't need two cars just in case the first one doesn't start. You need two plans. A lot of people say, well, the company is cheap. They're not going to buy me another car. Well, you don't need another car. You need another plan. And over here, it's easy. You can, you can have another plan. And PDCA is something that Deming invented. And it stands for plan, do, check, and act. And you have to do the necessary planning before you get into the business. And that necessary planning varies from person to person. But it is extremely important. It is absolutely, positively, unequivocally necessary for you to have a business plan. I know a lot of businesses who don't have business plan. And they are successful. But that doesn't mean business plan is not necessary. There is a booklet that you have uh, published on entrepreneurship and startup. And that is the entire book is about how to do it methodically. You can. Is it possible that you don't have any business plan, you become successful? Yes. The same way that you can smoke and not get a cancer. But that is not a good reason for smoking. That is not a scientific justification for not having the business plan. So it's very important that you have it. And PGCA, part of it is planning, implementing, checking if you are on the right track, and acting. Now, inside the PDCA, Get Kaizen came up with this 3S. First, you have to see the issues. A lot of people don't have the right glasses, so they don't see the issues. They walk right past it, and they don't see it. Now that you see it, you need to solve it scientifically in a way that the problem does not recur, so it's sustainable. What's the definition of systemic? Stagnant. Stagnant. Uh, stagnant, okay. S systemic? Throughout. Throughout the system. Systemic basically means holistic. Holistic. 
a collection of all the components within the system. So when you have a systemic look, it means that you look at everything. You don't just take one piece out and say, aha, uh -huh, I found it. No, it's the entire system. And systematic means step by step in an organized fashion, in a logical fashion. So you have to become systemic, look at everything in your business, and systematic, doing it in the right way. Do it in the logical, analytical, calculable way. Ideas are all around us. Priceline started looking at the same industry, same issues and everything else, and they came up with different solution. Let me tell you a story about my friend, uh, Albert Einstein. When Einstein taught at Princeton University, one day he gave a test. And after the test, his TA, teacher assistant, was helping him out with the boxes and books and everything else to his office. And TA said, well, Dr. Einstein, the test you just administered, weren't the same questions as last year? Einstein said, yeah, in fact, they were the same question as last year. And the TA said, well, Dr. Einstein, how could you have done this? You are known as a tough professor. How could you have given the same question twice in a row? And Einstein said something that is very applicable to all of us. Einstein said, it is true that the questions are the same as last year. However, this year, the answers have changed. Answers are changing around us regularly. Regularly, they are changing. Now, same industry. Priceline came and said, well, I can do something that I sell some of the seats three times more than other seats. This one is $817. This one is $490. This one is $190, right? So Priceline told United or Delta, whoever, I can sell your seats for you. Now, please tell me that this idea was not available to you and me, and only Priceline had the exclusive right about implementing this idea. Idea was there, right? They just came, they, they just did the gap analysis and came up with a solution. They found out what the problem was. A lot of planes were flying half empty or half full. As a result, Priceline came up with this idea. So you do the gap analysis, and if you are just 10%, and this is not a huge, magnificent, sophisticated breakthrough. It's just a simple idea that we can sell this seat to the people that are really in a hurry and they don't care about the price. And this guy has to see his grandma and cares about the price. And they, the person sitting next to you has paid different price for the same seat, going to the same destination, using the same amount of gasoline, using the same pilot, same airline, same air, same everything, paying same different price because of gap analysis and find out exactly what the problem was. Another prerequisite is Hoshan Country process. Hoshan Country is strategic planning, and that's basically in, in Japanese way. Business plan is a must. The main difference between Hoshan Country and regular strategic planning is that Hoshan Country will employ everybody within the organization. From CEO to janitorial level, everybody is working to satisfy the goals and objective of the organization. Flexibility or agility, because up to 70% of the C-level executive decisions turn out to be wrong. Now, if that's true, and this is by American Management Association, I didn't make it up. If this is true, how do you think we have anything done? We get anything done. If 70% of decisions are wrong, how do we get anything done in this world? Answer, they are quick enough to turn around and correct it. So they are agile, or they have the flexibility. Five wise is another systematic approach. You don't let it go until you get to the root cause. And sometimes off-the-wall ideas are good. So it's OK to come up with the off-the-wall ideas. 90% of the sales are closing after the fifth attempting close. And you and I quit after the second time the customer tells us no. After the first time. And sometimes we don't even call because we are afraid to hear the word no. Now, if you are annoyed by the word no, you have picked a very interesting field. Because you're going to hear a lot of no's. But you just have to keep at it 
and finally after the fifth closing attempt 98 percent of them will close and you regularly have to follow up with this kaizen process let's look at this for a few seconds and then uh, we go to question and answer ready fire aim now this is not a typo ready fire aim what does that mean what do i try to convey to you ready fire aim when you are reasonably ready you fire and if you don't hit the target you adjust aim over here means adjust right now because this is a lot better as far as decisiveness and as far as entrepreneurs is a lot better than the other options ready aim 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 right and this is what so so but quick is better than perfect but slow and there are four types of controls one is a strategic control make sure that once you strategize and once you come up with a strategy make sure that it's controlled and is guarded very jealously second one is a structural control the structure that will support the strategy within your organization next one is what operational control and the last one is financial control and as the great American philosopher Michael Jordan said just do it thank you any questions thanks we got about seven minutes if you have any questions yes understand your reference to all of this being applied in Japan and, and obviously there was a time when it was extremely successful in all in Japan and yet the last you know 10 15 years or so in Japan has not been that successful in all for them how, how do you how do you relate to that well I know that successful people make mistakes as well and if they are not quick enough to correct it that's what the question should be but the fact that why did you fail is not a good question because all of us fail why didn't you get up and shake yourself off and continue is a good question and I think Japan is doing it they have the foundation they have the systems and from time to time they don't like any other human being they don't follow it themselves and we had a fiasco about quality in Japan several years ago and their approach wasn't what they preach or what I preach but nevertheless they recognize it and uh, there were several changes made, but this is the right observation you are making. Yes, ma'am. Uh, sure. Five whys is a methodology that whenever you have an issue, you have to at least, and five is symbolic, of course you understand, it's symbolic. You have to ask at least five whys, and sometimes seven, and sometimes three, in order to get to the root cause of the problem. Don't accept it just because I give you an answer. You need to dig deeper and find out exactly what the root cause was. Because if you don't identify the root cause, and if you don't eliminate the root cause, the same issue is going to happen next week again. This time, a different time, different hour, different person, but the same issue until, uh, and the, the acid test for problem solving, are you familiar with acid test? Acid test for problem solving is that the problem does not recur. That's what it means. You're okay. So, um, it seems like there's a lot of different uh, systems going on here. I mean, there's lean, Kaizen, there's Fives, there's Hoshin, Kareem. So has Get Kaizen, your company, taken like a number of these and put them together? And, or, or are you just only using Kaizen? And what's the difference between Kaizen and Lean? I guess is the question. Good, good question. Well, what's the difference between Kaizen and Lean? Kaizen is a methodology, which means that you regularly have to follow this process of continuous improvement incrementally. And Lean is a byproduct when you do Kaizen, then Lean becomes a system that is waste-free, doesn't have Muda. And Muda is a Japanese way for waste, and waste is not something that you throw away. Waste is not only leftover. Waste is additional 20 minutes that you are waiting in the dentist's office, and they refuse to call you. That's waste, 
right? So any kind of ways, and there are seven plus one different types of ways that you have in your system and you don't extract it, you don't take it out, your system does not become lean. Once you do that, you become lean. It means you are getting waste free or going to that direction. And as far as different packages, yes, we, we, we normally start with the Hoshan country for the organizations because Hoshan country is going to give you the instruction manual for every position in your industry, in your company, your organization. And that instruction manual is, becomes the Bible that you know every morning what you, you have to do in order to meet the goals and objective of the organization. And it is almost impossible to do all these things and not reach the goals and objective. It is like taking the 880 north and not ending up in Oakland. It's almost impossible. Unless you exit and make a U-turn and etc. this will always take you to destination. So yes, there are different packages that, that we so do. Do you, do you consult with startups? Do you, can you help them to take these elements, these principles, and apply it to their business? Can you do that? Sure. These ideas, these concepts and systems are applicable to any kind of organization. Actually, the, some of the tools of Toyota production system is applicable in your own kitchen. Kanban, for example, something that uses, uh, is used to improve the inventory management can be used in your kitchen, in your refrigerator to make sure you don't run out of milk and sugar and butter and etc. So it is a, is a system, and system is applicable to any kind of business. Startup perhaps needed even the most because they really don't have this structure. Once you leave big corporations and you want to start your organization because you are passionate about your work, it is true you are passionate, but you are also structureless. The reason Cisco is successful, IBM is successful, it wasn't because of me working over there. It was because of the structure that they gave me working over there. I thought for years that Toyota was successful because of me. My department was very successful because of me. It is true they were successful, but it was because of the structure and infrastructure that they gave me, and yes, I did a decent job. Right? So this structure is actually more important for startups. One more minute. What is operational control? Operational control is day-to-day -day activities that you do within the organization. And somehow you need to make sure that all these things get done in order to, for you to reach your goals and objectives. So these are day-to-day -day activities that may be insignificant compared to a strategic control. But nevertheless, if somebody doesn't do the day-to-day -day activities, you, will never, you cannot strategize for the rest of your life. You, the same way as philosophy. You cannot philosophize. Once you philosophize enough, you need to go to the second P, which is process. You need to go into operation. Define your uh, perfect startup client. Perfect startup client. Your preferred startup client. Uh, that is uh, right idea. They do it systematically and they look at the entire thing as a system. Uh, the startups that are only passionate about their work, the passion normally dies down after day three. Right? But if they have the right idea and they look at the entire business as a business, as a business, it cannot be an emotional thing. You cannot not sell your car that doesn't start every other day just because you are in love with it because of the color or whatever. You cannot be emotional about your business. You have to be very, very cold, hard, uh, hearted about your business and systematically. Does, does that? Easiest to address will be operational control. Hardest will be the strategic control. Exactly. And that, that's, that's, yeah. That's, that's why, yeah, that, that's, that's a good way to summarize it. That's why I say systematic and systemic. It means that you have a strategy, you know exactly what you want to do. And then you have to tweak it a little bit. Otherwise, everybody can do the operation part. You tell me this is the number of staples that I have to remove. These are the number of stamps that I would have to put on. I can do it. 
My 16-year-old could do that when she was six. However, the strategy and following up with the strategy and the financial and having your finger on the pulse of the business is something that requires professionals. And that's why for those kind of things, I don't go to 99 cent store to get the cheap professional. These are important things. Yeah. And my, my suggestion is when you, you need a heart surgery, you don't go to 99 cent store. Structural control is the way you put your company together to make sure that if one day I'm not there, the whole structure doesn't fall apart, doesn't collapse, just because it, it is not person dependent, it is system dependent, right? This person leaves the uh, company, all of a sudden the whole thing collapses, is not a good sign of leadership for that person. Even though that person is going to brag about it, as soon as I walked away, the company collapsed. But that's not good for that. It's not a good reputation. Mark? Are your slides available? Yes, definitely. Uh, slides, I guess uh, Amanda and Jill told me that they will uh, email it as part of the, okay. yeah, right. part of the thank you. Uh, no, they would email it to you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Let's good. Let's thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.